Well, friends, we are glad that we are able to join in this place today to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to do so with confidence in him, but also asking him to give us confidence in his promises. The reality is that many of us have come here glad and joyful. Some have come confused and concerned. Most of us have come with some kind of mix of joy and sorrow of understanding and confidence in God's work, but at the same time a sense that we really wish God did feel more real at times. And we won't, don't want to pretend at church, we want to be real people here. There are times that we simply come into the Lord's service like this and recognize that the Lord does not feel as near as we wish he did. The psalmist knew that as well. And so Colleen is going to begin with a few words from Psalm 77 that speak to how it is that we can still trust the Lord even when he doesn't feel as near as we wish. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hands stretch out without wearying. My soul refused to be comforted. Oh, when I remember God, I mourn. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Then, then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? As his steadfast love forever cease? Are his promises at the end for all times? Then, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord, yes. I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, your way, God, is holy. What God is like our God? Congregation, what God is like our God? You are God who work wonders. You have made your might among you have made known your might among the people please stand with me friends father god how honest we can be before you since you know every thought before it is in our minds every word before it is on our tongue for out of the heart the mouth speaks. And you dwell within us at the very center of our affections in our heart. And so this morning, Heavenly Father, being honest before you is something that for many of us is not often easy. And yet we see the liberty that the psalmist exercises to be transparent and open and vulnerable even before the Lord. Asking questions that we might think are offensive to God but nevertheless, they are questions that we have, feelings that we deal with, thoughts that do roll through our minds. And we are so grateful, Heavenly Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ indeed understands. For he was tempted in all ways just like us, but without falling into sin as we do. And so the great high priest that we have today, dear God, is the one to whom we pray. The one who not only understands, but the one who is eager to hear and to help. 
And so throughout our worship service, dear God, with our tangled mess of contradictory thoughts and feelings, some that are righteous and true and some that are ugly and independent from you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would cause us to be thankful for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which covers all of our sins, which heals us from all our infirmities, and on which basis declares us righteous before you. Make us thankful for the gospel this day, Heavenly Father, we pray through Christ. Amen. You may have a seat, friends. As we begin this morning, before we sing, we are going to officially welcome our friend Mary Ivanoff into membership. I want to do that at the beginning of the service because at the business meeting last week, Mary was voted in by you as a legitimate covenant partner here of our church. And as Romans chapter 12 reminds us, that although we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body, and we are individually members of one another. And so I want, in the few services that David and Mary have for us, for a full-fledged membership to be Mary's privilege and our privilege as we come before the Lord as we begin this morning. And so I have a few questions for Mary, and then I have a few questions for you to join together in partnership in the gospel. Mary. Having professed your trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, you are now committing yourself in obedience to Christ, to love the brethren, and to serve together with them here in the cause of Christ, and to do so as part of the church family at Downsview Baptist Church. As you come openly to commit yourself to this part of God's church, indeed God's family, I would ask you to respond to these few questions and make clear your intentions. Mary, do you commit yourself today to join together with these the members of Downsview Baptist Church? And do you willingly offer unto the Lord all the gifts he has given you to join in ministry with and ministry to them? Mary, do you commit yourself to pray for, to encourage, to serve with them, as you see and as you seek to grow towards maturity in Christ along with them. Mary, do you acknowledge your need for these people? Do you willingly accept the various gifts that God has given them to encourage and to serve you? And do you admit your need for their prayers, their example, their God-given talents and their encouragement? And Mary, lastly, do you willingly accept their personal involvement in your life as together with them you seek to fulfill the mission of our Lord to go into all the world and make disciples. Will you do so, Mary, with the Lord being your sufficient source of strength to the end that he'll be honored in all that you do? Amen. Friends, members of Downsview Baptist Church, those of you who are indeed covenant partners and have joined together and committed yourself one to another, not just the body of Christ organically, but the body of Christ in this local communion, I have similar questions for you. And at the end, I would ask that if you can make that same commit to, commitment to Mary, as she has just made to you, I'm going to ask you to stand in recognition of that commitment. So friends, do you commit yourselves today to join together with Mary, who has become a member of Downsview Baptist Church? Do you willingly offer unto the Lord all the gifts that he has given you to join in ministry with and ministry to her? Do you commit yourselves to pray for and to encourage and to serve with her as you seek with her to grow towards maturity in Christ in doing so with the Lord being your helper? Friends, do you acknowledge your need for Mary? Do you willingly accept the various gifts that God has given her to encourage you and to serve you? Do you admit your need for her prayers, for her example, for her God-given talents and for her encouragement? Do you willingly accept her personal involvement in your life as you together with her seek to fulfill the mission of our Lord to go into all the world and to make disciples? Downsview Baptist Church, will you do so with the Lord being your sufficient source of strength to the end that he'll be honored in all that we do? Friends, if you can make this commitment, please indicate so by standing and joining me in a word of prayer.
Father in heaven, we bless your name this morning for the reality of the body of Christ. And we bless you specifically, dear God, for this specific expression of the body of Christ here at Downsview. We thank you, dear God, that we have been enriched yet again with another one of your flock committing herself to us and we to her. I pray that the standing of a congregation will be a tangible picture of encouragement and partnership as Mary, indeed as Mary and David, minister together your word and your love. I pray, Heavenly Father, in thanksgiving that we as the people of God are to be for one another. And as that is the case, we pray, dear God, that there will be a sense of mutual encouragement, of mutual accountability, and indeed mutual work together for growth and maturity in Christ. Would you above all, dear God, be all the more honored as this partnership together continues, we pray through Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, friends. And we are also going to pray for our elder. Grant Hallett, as you know, at our meeting last Sunday was uh, proposed to you by the leadership and you voted that he would indeed be one of the elders here at the church. In a moment, I'm going to ask Ivan and Renillo and Errol is going to come to pray over Grant. One of the key texts about being an elder is where the Apostle Peter, who himself was an elder, as it were, but in particular was an elder amongst a number of churches and wanted to set an example for those who would come after him. And so he said that those who would be elders are to be indeed shepherds of God's flock. And so shepherd the flock of God which is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those in your charge, but proving, proving is a word that's missing there, proving to be an example to the flock. And so for this privilege amongst us at our church family, Renello, Ivan, and Errol, would you come? And Grant, would you come? And Errol is going to pray over Grant at this time. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we come this morning in your presence receiving one of her brother as elder, leader of his church. Father, we ask your blessing upon him. We ask you to continue to use him and his family. Put your words in his mouth each time he speaks. And Father, manifest yourself in us and through him and through us. Use this word of deacons and elder as leader of Dunsview Baptist Church that we may do the work you call us to do and wants us to do. Father, bless Brother Grant, strengthen him, and just continue to use him as an instrument in your peace. In your name I ask it. Amen. 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 We're going to sing, and the first piece we're going to sing is about being redeemed. I have a verse here in the Bible in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, which says, uh, very, it's in him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of of his grace we're redeemed because God loved us in the beginning and he uh, 
chose us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have been redeemed. So we're going to sing together as uh, being redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So here we are. We're going to praise him about being redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Sing it. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. all the day long I sing for I cannot be silent His love is the theme of my song Redeemed 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 by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed Redeemed Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guarded my footsteps and giveth a song in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, 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 his child and forever. been redeemed but we're on the winning side did you know that there's always a winner and a loser but we're on the winning side because we have Jesus as our Redeemer and we can have victory with Jesus I mean uh, I this this past month has been a challenge to me when I look over our congregation and see some of the things that people have suffered and uh, you know grandchildren you know, and uh, people being tested. It's uh, but we we we're, we have victory in Christ. When when things look terrible, we we look to Jesus because He came to save us. So let's sing about having victory in Jesus. Jesus, 
some sweet day I'll sing out there the song of victory. Sing it. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea I heard a singing of the old redemption story. Sweet day I'll sing out there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is through him. He loves me to victory beneath us cleansing blood. He sought me, and he found me, and I rejoice. And knowing him personally as my Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's greet one another, shall we, in the name of our, our victorious Lord. Very thankful for, again, a church family that there are events beyond Sunday morning in our life, and we just want to point out a couple of them for you. Next Father, next Father, next Sunday is Father's Day, and so we want to especially bless the dads and the granddads among us, and so we are hoping two things will help to do that. ARC is pulling together another special, larger worship team worship morning, and so we'll have that next Sunday morning, as well as a barbecue that will immediately follow the service. But it's Father's Day. People don't stay for things like that. Well, we said that about the long weekend about a month ago. And the idea was there are people who have something special to do and special people to do it with on the long weekend, but there are some people who don't have that opportunity. Why don't we have something for them as well? And so we tried that, and boy, the church was packed. And so we said, why don't we do the same thing to try to encourage and honor the dads among us? And so if you have family plans, we know that, but a lot of you won't. And a lot of you, we know, will be very happy to stay. And so Andre and Svieta and the rest of their team are going to be preparing this week. And so please come and please plan to stay if you can and to honor the dads and the granddads. To give thanks to the Lord for the gift of fatherhood amongst us. And so next Sunday, immediately after our service. Now here's a couple of announcements that I guarantee I've, I'm going to say it in a way that's going to confuse someone. So let's just assume it's confused and we have to figure it out. Sunday school has three Sundays left. Now I know someone's going to say to me at the end of this service, so Sunday school's over for the summer? That's where my confusion comes in. <laughs> Let me try to clarify. 
some advance notice for the parents to know that the last Sunday of June is the last day for Sunday school for the summer. So there'll be a little bit of a summer break for the teachers who give themselves so diligently. So there's still three more Sundays. Today, the 18th, which is Father's Day, and the last Sunday of June will be the last day for Sunday school. So spread the word and keep that in mind. Also, our coffee that we have after church, which has been such a great time, its last Sunday will also be June 25th. And so that means we have three more Sundays of coffee after church. I imagine we'll still hang out after church a good bit. But just so you know, the formal uh, list and folks who are actually giving themselves to that will be both the last Sunday of the month for Sunday school and the last Sunday of the month for coffee time. So again, I apologize. I kept looking at that thinking, is that confusing or not? Help each other out to make sense of that, uh, if you would. You know, we had a real blessing this week. And you won't see them in the pews yet. We just did get the Bibles. But there's a sticker that's going to be in about a dozen or 15 of our pew Bibles. Miss Linda Anderson, who, as you know, passed about a month ago, her family very generously gave us a memorial donation. And I talked with her son, Clive, who I feel like we're all getting to know or at least know who he is. And we said, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to honor her memory? to donate and to dedicate a number of our hymn or our pew Bibles uh, in her, to her in her memory. And so you'll see in the coming weeks a number of the Bibles throughout our church that will have that dedication on it. Just what a, a beautiful way to remember her and what a wonderful legacy of love of the Word of God that she left behind. So we thank God for their generosity and we thank God for the opportunity to mark that. I also want to thank God for your generosity. I say this because, again, at last week's business meeting, we did bring in Mary as a member and Grant as, as an elder, but Emmy gave us this wonderfully encouraging financial report. Now, financial reports are not always as encouraging sometimes as others. So a year ago, at the uh, beginning of May, we would have taken in about $36,000. That's about $2,500 a week, $2,200 a week, and about $9,000 a month. You need to know that to meet our very bare minimum budget that we have, we need $10,000 a month. So a year ago, we were already four or $5,000 behind, and we had to pull things together as the year went on. This year, the great news that Emmy brought us is that by the end of May, or be the beginning of May, the end of April, we brought in not $36,000, $51,500. That means that instead of $2,200 a week, we brought in $3,200 and almost $13,000 a month. That is a blessing of an extra $15,000 up from where we were that same time a year ago. So listen, I know that sometimes when you ever talk about money, someone will say, all you ever do is talk about money. Well, the fact is we barely talk about money at this church. But there's no reason that when Jesus spoke about money, twice as many times as he spoke about heaven and hell combined. That means it's a priority for the Lord Jesus. We ought not to be afraid of that. Especially to give thanks to God's tools in his hand as you have been in your generous provision for this church family. And especially for us to take the time to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for his provision. So thank you for hearing us that we were short. Thank you for hearing us, that this ministry is only funded by what you give through e-transfer or directly in that plate. And so we do thank God, but we thank God for using you in the way that he has. We have a few minutes to think about a mission focus this morning as well. By the by, I put this here so I didn't forget it. Those of you who are involved in the musical worship teams, there is a new schedule on the Welcome Center there in the back. It'll also be emailed to you this week, but you'll see it there uh, posted on the back as well. We have a few minutes to think about our mission focus this morning. And I'm going to ask uh, David and Mary at one point uh, to come and to share with us not only about their ministry, but to actually minister the word of God to us for a few minutes. So come, Dave.
I'm not sure if you can relate to the idea that I can relate to, but I know what it's like personally to be someone who's a great starter, but not a great finisher. Do you know people like that? We maybe set out to do some terrific work project and we've got our tools and we've got all our supplies and everything there and we start with enthusiasm and vigor and six weeks later people are like, how's it going? You're like, well, started off good but haven't finished it yet. Often athletes are called those who are great starters but not particularly great finishers. I know what it's like to uh, begin in my pastoral ministry almost three decades ago and signing up for my Bachelor of Theology degree, which was literally distance education. That meant I listened to a cassette tape. Johnny, a cassette tape was a kind of communication that we used a long time ago. You can see him in the Smithsonian, yeah. Um, <laughs> I used to type out a lesson and I sent it by snail mail to Illinois. Someone actually physically marked it, sent it back to me in the mail and I went on. But it was supposed to take me a couple or three years and six and a half years later I was finally rejoicing that God had moved me to finish it. I know what it's like to be a great starter but not necessarily a great finisher. The reality is though that when it comes to the Christian life it's intended and frankly generally does work the opposite way. It's very difficult, as David reminded us sometimes, to have the gumption to actually find joy in sharing my faith, in actually speaking about Jesus with confidence and, and a sense of joy and, a, frankly, a lacking a sense of fearfulness. But as we do it, as we get rolling, as we start to memorize some verses, as we start to talk to people about Christ, or at least as people come to know that we are actually Christians, it, it starts to move a little bit. And although I wasn't necessarily a great starter, I'm actually getting better as I'm closer to the finish line. And yet, as you know, I've told you before that oftentimes an inconsistent Christian life can look like a hypocritical Christian life, can't it? It looks like the kind of life that says, well, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you shared your faith. I thought you were confident in what God was doing in your life. Why don't you talk about him more? Why is it that there's still things that you are trying to get rid of from your old life and they still seem to be clinging to you? Why is it that you can't seem to make the leap? I, it seems like you're quite a hypocrite. Remember, brothers and sisters, hypocrisy is claiming to be someone I know I'm not. The idea of a hypocrite comes from the Greek theater, acting. Pretending to be someone that we know we aren't. Christians are not hypocritical as we're trying to get along. We're just inconsistent. We aren't there yet. We mess up. We ask God to forgive us. Isn't that what 1 John chapter 2 says? As Christians, we do not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ the righteous who is himself the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus knows that we're not all that great at starting or finishing, particularly without Christ. And we need to be very slow before, as I said before, we start to accuse one another of hypocrisy when, frankly, we're just trying to get along. Johnny Cash, the late Johnny Cash, um, perhaps he was a Christian, I don't know much about him, but I do know that he wrote a country song that seemed to capture this for me. That someone's just a walking contradiction partly truth and partly fiction, taking every wrong direction on his lonely way back home. I thought, and I said it not that long ago to Pamela, I said, some days I just feel like my life is a walking contradiction. I say I want to live for Jesus. And the thoughts that come to mind when someone cuts me off on the 401, it's, what am I doing? How did that happen? How, what, what is it that I find myself enjoying watching on television? The kind of movies that I enjoy, I don't mean the kind of smut and filth. I mean, why am I taking joy from movies that are all about fighting and anger? That, that there's watching a boxing match and watching people beat up each other and calling that some kind of entertainment. I find myself saying, boy, I, it, it's a, why is it still a struggle that every single day when I read my Bible, which by God's grace I do, it's still a struggle. I've been at this thing for three plus decades as a professional Christian. You pay me to be a Christian man who tells you about the Lord. 
And I feel at times that my life is just this walking contradiction. I'm partly truth and I'm partly fiction. Don't you feel that? You understand? Are you in this with me? You understand what it's like, don't you? When you're honest with yourself before the Lord, you understand that you're not saved by works. And so you look at your works and you want them to reflect the fact that Jesus has saved you. And you think, oh man, I suppose I'm not absolutely hypocritical, but boy am I inconsistent. And yet, brothers and sisters, is that not what we've seen already in the book of Numbers? That Moses, the leader of the people of Israel, just like us, that Moses himself was a tangled mix of contradictions. Well, seemingly contradictions. Moses had all kinds of motivations and actions that seemed on one hand hypocritical, at least inconsistent. They're just a mix of what looks like a walking contradiction. You know who Moses was? Moses was a man just like us. And Moses was a man just like us. As God says throughout his scriptures, that he always uses broken instruments to make beautiful music. David said a minute ago, God often works through the weak. I would suggest God only has weak men to work through. Weak men and women to work through. And God does wonderful things. Understanding that although we are inconsistent, unless we are claiming to be perfect, we are not the hypocrites that sometimes we look like. We should have over our Christian life, men and women, boys and girls, that God is still under construction. He's still at work in me. And so please, like this little caterpillar, be patient. God's not finished with me yet. Boy, when you're in a Christian relationship and you know that about each other, and there's a liberty to go, I'm trying. I'm struggling. I'm not pretending all the externals are exactly right. And it's all about the externals. Like, yeah, sometimes the external looks a mess. But I'm trying. By God's grace, I'm pressing forward. And that's a beautiful example we have of Moses in particular with the people of God. Which is why Solomon was so wise. That those of us who aren't great starters or great finishers... In fact is the end of the thing is better than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. What's Solomon saying? Saying, of course, our Christian life is going to look like it's inconsistent and even hypocritical. That's the beginning of it. As we move forward, as God grows us, as God grows us as a result of many of our inconsistencies, God shapes us and molds us into the image of his dear son. And I'm wanting to use Moses as a bit of an example for that today. I'm trying to pull in a couple of threads from last Sunday and see that there's actually another side and another way to understand, if not an, another way, just a deeper way to understand what Moses was going through and frankly how similar he is to you and I. So again, take your Bibles, as David said, turn to the book of Numbers, if you will, and look at the 11th chapter, which we left off in last Sunday, Numbers chapter 11. If you use those pew Bibles dedicated to Miss Linda or otherwise, you will find it on page 119 or page 140. I'm going to walk through a little bit of the chapter and then we will pause and read as we go. But as we begin, as you're turning there, let me ask you to ask God's help along with me. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. We ask that your kingdom would be established in the midst of our praises as your people declare your mighty work. We say with the psalmist in Psalm 77, who is a God like our God. You are a God who works wonders. You have made known your might among your people. And as we see you making your might known in forgiveness and in discipline, in molding and shaping out of complaints and frustrations, but also out of legitimate prayers, I ask Heavenly Father, as we see our own weaknesses in these passages, that you would cause us to reach out for the one who has only looked forward to in the time of numbers, the one that we can look to directly now, our great high priest, who always lives to intercede for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. 
Book of Numbers, as you'll recall, had three major spots. They were in the desert of Sinai, the desert of Paran, and the desert of Moab. The first stage, as we saw last week, essentially the first ten chapters, is when they were in the wilderness of Sinai. Sinai should sound familiar, Mount Sinai, the place in Exodus chapter 20, the book before this, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. About a year after they came into Sinai, they start to move forward towards this place called the wilderness of Paran. That's where we began to look at last week, which is essentially chapter 13 to 19. Which means that if it's chapter 1 to 10 and 13 to 19, that means we've got an in-between spot. And it's a journey from Sinai, after about a year there, into the wilderness of Paran. That's generally where chapters 10 to 13 take us. Which means that that little section there is where we're looking at, they're on the move. The cloud has come, the cloud has moved forward, God has given instruction through Moses to pack up and follow me. We're going from Sinai into the next major portion of the book, into the wilderness of Paran. And that means that what we're going to find there is Moses, the leader of the people of Israel, just like us, is a tangled mix of contradictions. And I want you to see that, and I want you to find some liberty <laughs> to be a tangled mix of contradiction yourself. You remember when he started out last week, they started out from Sinai into the wilderness of Paran with tremendous confidence in the Lord. The end of chapter 10, Moses said to his brother-in-law at this case, we are setting out for the place which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Confidence. So he says, come with us and we will do good to you for, because, why will we do good to you? Because the Lord has promised good to Israel. Tremendous confidence in the promises of God. And before we know it, the tremendous confidence turns to terrible complaints. Not to the Lord, but about the Lord. The people themselves are complaining against the Lord. Chapter 11 opens with this, doesn't it? Chapter 11 and verse 1. The people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And yet, we saw it wasn't just the people who started to complain, it was even Moses himself. Down in chapter 11 and verse 10, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, and what did he do? The anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses himself was upset. Drop down to chapter 11, verse 11. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt so ill with your servant? This is not good the way you're dealing with me. Why have I not found favor in your sight? Why you lay this burden of these people upon me? In fact, he concludes in verse 15, If this is how you're going to treat me, kill me now. Kill me now if I find favor in your sight. If, I find, if, if you're going to be good to me, here's how you could do good. Just kill me. I would rather die than lead these people. Well, Moses, that's pretty heavy. And what do you have there? You have tremendous confidence in their beginning. You have terrible complaining on the other end. And you have tangled conflict in the midst. And that arrow that you see on the screen is intended to understand that they go both from confidence to complaint, back to confidence, back to complaining. And it's somewhere in the midst of that, that Gordian knot of motivations and actions. It's all tangled up together. What you have with that tangled mess is actually a tangled call of conflicted crying out to the Lord. Confidence in the Lord, complaining about the Lord, but now he's actually moving to calling out to God. And this is where we start to see more of what's actually happening. And I hope you can see yourself in this. We're very quick to accuse one another of these kind of things without recognizing how similar we are to this very thing. The reality is that in Psalm 77, as Colleen opened this, the worship service for us today, what was the psalmist saying? He's saying, I cry out to God, aloud to the Lord. He will hear me. 
In the day of my trouble, I will seek him. In my night, my in the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted until God comforts me. I'll not be comforted. He expects God to hear him. And yet, in verse three, the psalmist says, "When I remember God, I don't rejoice. I moan. I groan." It's a wearisome thing to me. When I meditate on God, when I think about God, when I ponder, my spirit faints. Remember that word Selah? It's like pause. Just let it hit you. Let it, let it grip you for a minute. This is the kind of confliction, conflicting motivations that even the psalmist himself would have had. And yet, in the midst of conflicted, emotions and motivations not just Moses but ours as well what look what Moses does number one Moses does pray for the people I know it sounds like he's frustrated and I think there's a mix of that but he does the first thing that you see is he actually does pray for the people when God's anger was kindled, when the fire burned among them, the people cried out to Moses, not to God, they cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord. He did go before the Lord in prayer. That's true. The second thing that he did to start to see this conflicting tangle is being redeemed, he not only prayed to the Lord, Moses prays not just about the Lord, but he prays specifically to the Lord. He speaks to the Lord. Moses heard the people weeping and he said to the Lord. He wasn't just thinking about God generically. He prayed directly to God. Look at what he says. Why have you dealt so ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of these people on me? Lord, did, did I conceive these people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child up to the land that you swore to your forefathers? Where am I going to get meat to feed all these people? They weep. They, they're before me and they say, give us meat that we may eat. Lord, I'm not able to carry this people alone. This burden is too much for me. Do you see the other emphasis that's mixed in there with Moses' frustration? He does pray, and he does pray to God specifically. And notice this, and this is wonderful, it was pointed out to me in the commentaries. Moses is not judged for articulating his frustrations. That was very helpful for me to look at that. You might notice that the psalmist in Psalm 77, his God cast off forever, has his steadfast love forever ceased, has he forgotten to be gracious? You think it's almost blasphemous statements the psalmist is making. He's never judged. He's not disciplined for that kind of transparency. And neither Moses, neither is Moses judged for his, quote, frustrations. It is the people in their explicit complaints the people complained against God. Chapter 11 and verse 1. They complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. The Lord heard it and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them. Specifically, the people are judged. Drop down to chapter 11 and verse 20. Because you people have rejected the Lord. You're not praying to him. They've rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? That's the truth. Drop down to verse 33. And yet while the meat was still in their teeth, remember God provided the quail they asked for? God does provide it. While the meat was still in their teeth, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and the Lord struck down the people with the very great plague. Doesn't tell us exactly how many of the people, but it seemed like a significant amount. Doesn't tell us what this plague may have been. May, have been. may it have been food poisoning, perhaps, from these quail? Doesn't tell us exactly. But what we know for sure is that the Lord judges the people for their complaining, but does not judge Moses for his. 
The fourth thing that happens is Moses is helped when he calls out. He's actually helped when he comes before the Lord asking for it. Chapter 11 and verse 16. When Moses said, it's too much for me, this burden's too heavy for me, God provides. Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel. Bring them to the tent of meeting. Let them take their stand along with you. The help that you're asking for is the help that you've received. I will come down, God says in verse 17. Take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you. So that you do not have to do it alone. Moses asks for help. And Moses receives help. Down in verse 23, when God is speaking rhetorically to Moses saying, are all these herds going to be slaughtered? Are we going to bring all the fish out of the sea? How are we going to feed all these people? And the Lord asks rhetorically, is the Lord's hand shortened? Can I not reach into here, Moses? He says, you shall now see whether my word will come true for you. Again, it's a rhetorical question, but it's really a rhetorical question in his response, isn't it? Has God's hand been shortened? Of course not. Is my word going to come true? Watch this, Moses. Yes, it will. The help that he actually asked for. So look what's going on. Moses asked for God's help. He asked when the people need help. And he asked when he himself needs help. And he acknowledges that God is the one who brought them to this place. And he expects God to see it through. Did I bring these people out here? Did I can see them? Did I promise them this land? No, he's saying, God, you brought them here. I'm putting that on you, but I'm expecting you to do what they need from you. Brothers and sisters, what you essentially have mixed in with this tangle of conflicting motivations is Moses' lament to God on behalf of the people. Not instead of what we said last week, as well as a mixture of both his frustrations and his complaints and his legitimate crying out, lamenting before the Lord. Do you remember this book two years ago? Right in the midst of COVID, the first summer, I was at a pastor's conference and was given this book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, The Biblical Discipline of Lament. It's written by Mark Vrogoff, who's a pastor at City Church in Indianapolis. And he helped instruct us to this idea that lament, throughout the Bible, lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Moses was praying in the midst of his pain that led him to a greater trust in the Lord. Do you remember when we looked at this? I'm going to go quickly, but you remember? Turn to the Lord, bring your complaint before the Lord, ask the Lord, and then trust the Lord. When we're in the midst of our difficulty, what do we do? We turn, take our focus off our problem, and we put our focus on to the Lord. Secondly, we articulate our specific struggles to the Lord. That's complaining. We ask, that is, we plead with the Lord for relief from our hardships, which causes us, lastly, to trust, which is a declaration of my hope in the revealed assurances of my Lord. And this is usually where we get tripped up. We turn to the Lord. We ask Him for help. We can even declare our trust. But the idea of complaining to the Lord seems a bit awkward to us. And yet it's the very thing that we do quietly in our own hearts, with our spouses, with our close friends, or with people that have no accountability in our life with us, online, or at a conference, or on the work site, somewhere where they're not involved in our life. Rah, 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 rah. No, no, that's not what complaining is here. Complaining is an articulation of the specific struggles I'm having, not about God, but articulating it to God. That's where it goes. Moses was lamenting to God on behalf of the people of Israel. That's what's going on there. To God. To Him. Bringing His complaint to the Lord. Asking the Lord for help. And I know that complaining about the Lord is something that we do. 
the brothers and sisters complaining about God is simply not a freedom that we have. Even when we have a good reason, we think we have a good reason to complain about God. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. This, how's this going on? Why has this not been answered? And many of you are right now thinking about the kind of things that Grant said at the beginning of our service. It's been a tough couple of weeks. There's a tough, tough couple of weeks in front of us. Many folks have challenged in their lives, their relationships, their health, their employment. I know. And yet I don't have a clue the way God knows. You don't even know as well as God knows even those of you who know your struggles. And yet complaining about how God is dealing with this world is simply not a freedom we have. It is blasphemous to suggest to God that he is not doing all that he ought to be doing or the way that he should be doing it or to the degree that he should be doing it or with the speed that I demand. I do not have the freedom to complain about God. And yet, brothers and sisters, complaining to God is a privilege we so often ignore. Bringing our complaint before the Lord. And you're looking for some biblical background, I know. Psalm 55 and verse 17, evening and morning at noon, I utter my complaint and I moan. And he hears my voice. Do you hear that? He wants to hear because he wants to help. Psalm 64, hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve me, preserve my life from the dread of my enemy. Psalm 64, verse 1. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. So there's a place to pour out our difficulties before the Lord. Crying out for help in the midst of that. And even yet in the midst of that, Moses, like us, with a tangled, conflicted motivation, Moses is nevertheless still a genuine mediator before God on behalf of the people. That is who Moses is. He goes before the Lord on behalf of the people with his lament, with their complaints, asking that God would help. And he genuinely pleads for the people before the Lord. He does that. He should be commended for it. He is a fine example for us. Yet as much as he pleads genuinely, he never pleaded perfectly. He doesn't plead perfectly, which is how we get to Jesus. Look over in Hebrews chapter 3 if you have your Bibles, friends. Each time we come here, we are seeking to encounter Jesus through the book of Numbers. Hebrews chapter 3. We have this beautiful reality that God speaks about how he deals with his people. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, brothers, you who share in this heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Please, brothers and sisters, I, I, I wanted to have it bigger on the screen. That There's the call for us this morning. In the midst of our difficulty, in our unresolved complaints, in our conflicted laments, Consider Jesus. Look to Jesus. Think about Jesus. Meditate. Ponder. Consider Jesus. The apostle. The high priest of our confession. Who was faithful to him who appointed him. Just as Moses. Was also faithful in God's house. Moses was faithful. Moses was a fine servant of the Lord. And yet Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Because Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant. As a servant amongst the people of God. As a servant to testify to the things that were spoken of later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. As the heir. As the one who has the father's ear. The authority in the, in the lineage of the father. No greater honor could the Father give but to call Jesus his Son. 
Christ's faithfulness was not just as a servant, but as a son. And we are his house, his people, if we hold fast in confidence in our boasting, in our hope. That's what considering Jesus does. The perfect mediator between, between God and man. Look over at chapter 9 and you'll see it even more clearly. Chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, Jesus is the mediator, the go-between, the one who goes on behalf of, of a new deal, a new way of dealing between God and man, a new covenant, so that what? Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death occurred, Christ's death occurred, that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Yes, the people sinned. Yes, Moses sinned. Yes, I sin and you sin. And trying to make our way back to God by keeping that law will always end in frustration or idolatry. We'll be frustrated or we'll make an idol out of our own efforts. Instead, we lay ourselves bare before the Jesus who we consider and we recognize that he is the mediator of this beautiful new way of dealing with God. Which means in the midst of all of my muddle-headed, my tangled motivation, Jesus brings clarity. Jesus is the one who cuts through all of my confusion before the Lord. Jesus resolves my tangled conflict of motivation. That's who he is. That's what he promises to do. That's how we see Jesus in the faithful, tangled service of Moses. That's where we as tangled motivation, all kinds of conflicts in our mind, that is the one to whom we look. So friends, let me encourage you. In the midst of the difficulties and the challenges and the things that frustrate you, and you are tempted to complain about God, you might as well be honest before the Lord. He already knows what you're thinking. God knows your heart. You can't fool him. Oh, I can fool my wife. I can fool a lot of you for a while. We can put on our Sunday suits and everything's fine and we can major in the externals. Can't fool the Lord. I've said just again and again and again. I've heard it from Grant that God looks at the heart, right? It's always reminding us, God looks inward. So when you're struggling before the Lord, just be honest before the Lord. Some of you have heard me say when Pam and I do our good bit of marriage counseling, it's not just being honest with one another, it's being transparent. See, see honesty volunteer, or honesty gives honest answers real true answers but transparency volunteers helpful information god god knows anyway be honest with the lord and then cry out in your frustrations god what are you doing i don't get it i don't understand i'm not trying to instruct you but i'm a mix of contradictory motivations and feelings just cry out to him and then recognize, ask God to give you grace to recognize your complaints about him versus things that are just your complaints to him. It's risky. It is risky. But we're doing it anyway. We're angry and frustrated before the Lord all the time. Do you remember what God has been saying throughout the book of Numbers? Why did you cry out against me when you spoke out against Moses? Oh, we, we're not mad at you, God. We're just mad at these people. I'm not upset with you, Lord. It's just my circumstances. God's like, no, no, no. Those are my people and my circumstances. I'm in charge of all of it. You have a problem and angry about it. You have a problem with me. And with great risk, we go before the Lord and say, God, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like right in that moment. Do you ever find yourself doing this? You have those little conversations with yourself about someone and God just stops you and you go, oh, shut up, Pete. Kids aren't here, right? Can I say that? <laughs> just knock it off. I'm so sorry. How many times over 32 years of marriage have Pam and I looked at each other, she always fixes us with that little smile. And I go, oh, I'm sorry. 
Like, just, just, can I just stop it? Can we just, can we just give it a rest? Because you just realize how stupid you sound. But then you go before the Lord with your complaint, not about God, but you bring it to God. Lord, I don't know what to do with this. What do I do with all these people? And all this meat they didn't want to eat. They're, the burden's too big for me. What am I supposed to do? You plead with God. And you start by confessing when you recognize you've been complaining about him. But then you plead that God would receive the complaints you have that you're bringing, not about him, but to him. And how do you end? You praise God for the gospel of the one who works it all out. Because frankly, it's still going to be confusing sometimes, isn't it? Don't you find it? I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm thinking. Is this about God or to God? I don't know. Lord, I just bring myself to you and put myself under the blood. Would you just work it all out, please? Would you just find yourself at the end of the book of Revelation once in a while? Oh, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Just wrap this crazy thing up, would you? Just, I know you're the one who works it all out. I know you've done all that's required to honor you by caring for your people. Just, just let me just leave myself before you. Because the one who always keeps his promises is the one who's given his word. That's what he said to Moses. That's what he's saying to Moses, telling Moses, I'm going to protect these. I'm going to bring them into this land. And eventually Moses just comes before the Lord. Okay, do what you have to do. Do it the way you need to do it. Because God, as we are celebrating this month, and please do not be afraid to celebrate the rainbow. It is a sign of God's promise. God always keeps his word. He is a promise keeper. And all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. Christ is the emphatic yes to all the promises that God the Father makes to his people. Friends, would you stand with me and let's pray as we close our service. I pray to your God that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that the love of the Son, that the divine mix of God himself would simply hear and heed and heal and help as the people of God that we are begging for what we need from you. We recognize, dear God, that it can only come from you. We're thankful, dear God, that you are moving us today to be all the more patient with one another, that the end of our lives will be better than the beginning of our lives, that tomorrow should be better than yesterday, that this Lord's day we should have grown from last. And we're trying, and we're struggling, and we need your help, dear God. And we're so glad that we can pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of a new covenant who always lives to intercede for his people. And so we pray, dear God, as we lay ourselves bare before you this day, that you would hear the challenges of this life, that we walk that risky line between complaints about you and complaints to be simply brought to you. Help us, I pray, dear God, to see the liberty of the example of your servant, Moses, our servant, Moses, who was faithful indeed before you, imperfect but genuine, just as we seek to be before you. So, dear God, in thanksgiving for a service that has been full of your grace and mercy, I pray that you would equip us to go and display that now. We pray through Christ. Amen. Thanks for coming today, friends. We're dismissed.